Hi, my name's Anil Gomes. I'm a philosopher at the University of Oxford, and we're here today to talk about a topic in the philosophy of mind, eliminative materialism. So what is eliminative materialism? Well, it's, it's a bit of a mouthful. So let's start with the eliminative bit. To eliminate something is to say that it doesn't exist. So you can think that atheists are eliminativists about God. They say that God doesn't exist. And maybe hardcore determinists are eliminativists about free will. They say that free will doesn't exist. Now, given that we're talking about a topic in the philosophy of mind, you can guess that eliminative materialists want to eliminate something in the philosophy of mind. And in particular, they want to eliminate the mind. They think there are no such things as mental states, at least as we ordinarily understand them. Now, we'll finesse that idea a bit in a moment, but for now it might be useful to think about eliminative materialism as a kind of error theory. Think about all of those ordinary ways we have of talking about the mind. We talk about what other people are thinking and what they want for Christmas. We talk about the painful fall that we had last week. The eliminative materialist wants to say that all of those ways of thinking, all of those ways of talking, are just false. There's no such thing as the mental. That's what it is to eliminate the mind. So let's try and make that a bit more precise. We can introduce the notion of common sense psychology. Common sense psychology is just that ordinary picture that we have, that we all have, about the way the mind works. It's a picture of the mind on which people think things and people want things and people have feelings and emotions and pains. And common sense psychology bundles all of these things together and gives us a picture about the mind and how it fits into the world. And the eliminative materialist wants to say that this picture is just fundamentally mistaken. I mean, it's a little bit like what the committed atheist says to the religious believer's picture about the way the world works. So the religious believer has a picture of the world in which there's a God and maybe grace and miracles and things like that. And the atheist wants to say, look, there's just nothing in the world which corresponds to your picture. In the same kind of way, the limited materialist wants to say, there's nothing in the world which matches up to that common sense, ordinary picture we have about the way the mind works. And given that there's nothing in the world which kind of corresponds to that picture, we should eliminate it. We should get rid of it. Now, that's the basic view, right? But of course, there are all kinds of ways in which we can make that more complicated. I mean, in particular, our common sense understanding of the mind has lots of various bits to it, lots of various categories, right? We have beliefs and desires, but we've also got pains and emotions and feelings and probably lots of other categories besides. And once you realise there's that kind of complexity to our ordinary picture of the mind, we can say, well, which bits of the mind does the limited materialist want to get rid of? Do they want to get rid of all of it or just some of it? The kind of view I'm going to be thinking about today, the limited materialist view I want us to think about today, is one on which there are no beliefs or desires, where we get rid of beliefs and desires. So there's no such thing as someone believing something, no such thing as someone wanting something. An interesting question for you to think about is whether the kind of arguments we're going to be looking at today carry on over to the other bits in the mind, right? or whether they only apply to beliefs and desires, what philosophers sometimes call the intentional mental states. OK, but our focus today is going to be on eliminating materialism, understood as a claim that there are no such things as beliefs and desires. Now, that's a really radical claim, right? It's not hard to get yourself into the kind of frame of mind when you can wonder about whether trees exist or whether tables exist, right? But the limited materialist wants to say that the mind doesn't exist, right? People don't believe things. There are no beliefs, there are no desires. And when you have a radical claim like that, you really need to look closely at the arguments for it to think about whether they're any good. So that's what we're going to do today, right? Look at some of the arguments for the view. <laughs> OK, but before we look at the arguments, we need to make an important distinction. A distinction between elimination and reduction. And if you don't understand this distinction, you're not going to understand the view. So, eliminative materialism, as we just talked about it, wants to eliminate the mental. and wants to get rid of the mental. That needs to be distinguished from those views which want to reduce the mental. So how should we think about this distinction? This distinction between elimination and reduction. Well, to eliminate something is to get rid of it, right? So if we're eliminating mental states, we're saying that they don't exist. 
Right? There are no such things as mental states. There's nothing in the world which matches up to our mental ways of talking. In contrast, to reduce one thing to another is not to say that it doesn't exist. It's to say that we've just found out something about its nature. So say you're the kind of person who thinks that mental states are identical to brain states. Well, that's a perfectly respectable view in the philosophy of mind. That's not a view in which we're eliminating mental states. Say you think that all there is to believing something is to be in a particular kind of brain state. You've not eliminated beliefs. You're just saying that beliefs are just identical to brain states. Beliefs still exist. It just turns out that they're brain states of a certain sort. So those kind of reductionist pictures in the philosophy of mind don't eliminate beliefs. They just say that they're identical to something else. So reduction and elimination need to be really kept apart. Elimination is a much more radical idea that there are no such things as beliefs and desires, that we have to get rid of them completely. Now, in practice, it might be hard to figure out whether a particular view is reducing something or eliminating it. But the reason that it's important for you to keep hold of this distinction is that there are lots of reductionist views in the philosophy of mind. Right? Some people think that mental states are just brain states. Other people think that mental states are just complex functional organisations of matter. Right? There are lots of different views you might hold here. The limited materialist wants to go a step further and say, it's not that beliefs are identical to brain states. It's not that they're identical to functional states of a certain sort. Beliefs just don't exist. That's the kind of radical view that we want to consider. And you can only really understand it if you keep that distinction between elimination and reduction firmly in mind. OK, so what about the arguments? If we're going to take this view seriously, we need to think about what kind of arguments can be said in its favour. Well, in some ways, the argument for limited materialism is really straightforward. It's just got two premises. We'll take them in turn. So the first premise says that our common sense psychology, our common sense understanding of the mind, is a kind of theory. The second premise says that theory is fundamentally mistaken. You put those premises together and you get a reason to get rid of the theory. Our common sense psychology is a kind of theory. It's a radically mistaken theory, so we should get rid of the theory. And that just means we should eliminate the mind. So in order to get a sense of this kind of way of reasoning, it's kind of helpful to think about how theory change happens more generally. So often in the history of science, we replace one theory with a better one. So we used to have this theory about the way that heat worked, right, called the caloric theory. The idea was that hot things have a fluid in it called caloric, and when my cup of tea is cooling down, the caloric is kind of leaching out of it into other objects around it. Right? So the caloric fluid is coming out of my cup of tea and going into my hands, and that's why my hands are warming up and the cup of tea is getting colder. It turns out that's a bad theory, right? There are all kinds of problems with it. And we've replaced that theory with a better scientific theory, a theory on which... Heat is just identical to mean molecular motion. So what happened to the old theory? Right? What did we do with the old caloric theory? Well, we eliminated it. We got rid of the theory. We don't talk about it anymore. But to eliminate the theory just means to eliminate the things which are talked about in the theory. So we eliminated caloric. There's no such thing as caloric fluid. The process in science of one theory replacing another theory means getting rid of the old theory. And in particular, it means getting rid of the things that the old theory talks about. And in a way, the limited materialist wants to say that our common sense psychology is like that. It's a theory about the way the world works, but it's a really bad theory. So when we get a better theory, we should get rid of the old theory and eliminate it. And that means eliminating some of the things that it talks about, like beliefs and like desires. So let's see how this works for each of the premises. So I said that the argument's got two premises. Right? The first premise was that common sense psychology is a kind of theory. So the idea here is that we use our mental ways of talking, our mental concepts, as ways of explaining what's going on in the world around us. In particular, when we're using our mental theories, what we want to do is try to explain the way people behave. So maybe someone's moving towards the fridge and I'm trying to give an explanation of her behaviour. I might say that she believes there's milk in the fridge and she wants some milk for a cup of tea. Right? We've got something which needs explanation. Why is this person moving in this way? 
And then we talk about her beliefs and her desires as a way of explaining why she moves. That's a way of showing, the illuminative materialist says, that common sense psychology is a kind of theory. It's a kind of theory which is set up to try to explain the way people move around the world. Now, of course, if it is a theory, it's not the kind of theory that you learn about in school, right? It wasn't there was a scientific textbook which taught us this theory. Maybe it's a theory that we all learned at an early age or one that we were born with. And maybe it's a kind of theory that is implicit or tacit, right? When we operate and use, even though we don't know that we're operating and using it. None of that challenges the idea, the limited materialist says, that common sense psychology is a kind of theory. That's the important first premise. The second premise of the argument says that this theory is false. And because it's false, we should reject it. So, I mean, why would you think common sense psychology is false? Well, the rough idea is that we're going to get better theories, better theories which explain how people move around the world. In particular, we're going to get theories from neuroscience. And the theories that we get from neuroscience just aren't going to match up in any obvious way to the theories that we have from common sense psychology. And when you don't find that match-up, right, when the neuroscientific theory just doesn't involve talking about any of the same things that the common sense psychological theory talks about, then we have to get rid of the common sense psychological theory. We have to replace it with the neuroscientific theory. I mean, just to give you an idea of how this might work, I mean, maybe it's part of our common sense psychology that there's this notion such as willpower, right? We talk about some people having willpower, or we say, look, I lacked the willpower in order to resist that extra marshmallow, right? Maybe the best neuroscientific theories are going to tell us there's no such thing as willpower. Right? When they look at the way the brain works, there's just nothing which seems to correspond to our folk notion of willpower. In that case, the limited materialist says, we need to get rid of the notion of willpower. It's an old idea which goes with an old theory, and we need to replace it with a proper neuroscientific theory. So... Why does the limited materialist think that these theories which we're going to get from neuroscience are not going to look anything like our common sense psychological theories? Well, there are kind of two ways they might try to make this point. One is by analogy. Think about our common sense physics, right? So we have a kind of ordinary understanding of the, the way objects move around the world, right? That if I drop this cup, it's going to shatter on the floor. We understand about how to throw rocks and tennis balls and so on. And it turns out that the kind of scientific understanding of the way objects move just looks nothing like our kind of common sense understanding of physics. So we have the common sense understanding of physics, but then we've got the scientific understanding of physics. And it's the scientific understanding of physics which really is going to tell us about the way objects really move. So the thought is that common sense psychology is a bit like common sense physics. Eventually it's going to be replaced by scientific psychology and scientific physics. And when that happens... We need to go with the scientific views and get rid of the earlier folk common sense theories. A second way in which limited materialists try to motivate this idea is by saying that there's a principled reason why the theories you get in neuroscience just could never look like common sense psychological theories. And that's because it's an important part of our common sense theories that we have beliefs and desires and that our beliefs and desires are about the world. Right, so when I believe that Manchester is the greatest city on earth, I believe something about how things are in the world. And when I want a cup of tea, right, I want something about the world. Philosophers sometimes put this by saying beliefs and desires are intentional states. They're states which are about things. But the limited materialists might say, the theories which you get in neuroscience are just not about anything in the same way. The things that neuroscience talks about Neural states just can't be about things in the way that beliefs and desires are about things. So the kind of things you're going to find in your best neuroscientific theories are just not going to match up to the kind of things that common sense psychology talks about. So we've got a rough sense of the view, and we've got a rough sense of the argument for it. In limited materialist, want to say there's no such things as mental states. In particular, the view we're thinking about says there are no such things as beliefs and desires. And the argument has these two claims that common sense psychology is a kind of theory, and that theory is radically false. What should we say about this argument? Well, there are two ways of responding to the argument which correspond to each of its premises. One way to respond to the argument is to reject the idea that common sense psychology is a kind of theory. The other is to reject the idea that it's a bad theory. So how would those responses go? Well, let's take the first route. Why should we think of common sense psychology as a kind of theory? 
You might say, we don't need a theory to tell us about everything. Some things we could just directly perceive. So we might have a theory about electrons and protons because we can't directly observe them. But I don't need a theory to tell me that trees exist and tables exist because I could just look around the place and see them. And so you might say, common sense psychology isn't a theory at all. Because in the same way that I can look out my window and see the lovely tree outside, so I can just look inside myself and see my beliefs and desires. I don't need a theory to tell me that they exist, because I can just see my beliefs and desires. Taking this line of response requires us to think about some really fascinating questions about how it is we know that we have beliefs and desires in the first place. Is there any sense in which I could see my own mental states in the way I can see trees and tables? That's the kind of line which we need to think about if we're going to challenge that first premise, that common sense psychology is a kind of theory. The second kind of way of responding to the argument is to reject the claim that common sense psychology is a bad theory. Right? Someone might say, look, OK, I agree with you that common sense psychology is a theory, but in fact it's a really good theory. I mean, after all, it's pretty good at making predictions. I don't need to know anything about your neural states in order to be able to predict that you're going to get a cup of tea. Right? Maybe I just know that you're thirsty and I know something about the kind of time of day when you're likely to want to refill your cup. Common sense psychology looks really good at predicting the way people move around the world. By talking about your beliefs and desires, that seems a really good way of explaining what it is that you're going to go on to do. So this way of responding to the argument accepts the fact that it's a theory, but wants to defend the idea that it's a good theory. It's actually a really good way of predicting the way people behave. OK, that's a good place for us to stop. In limited materialism, we said, is this really radical view, that there are no such things as mental states. And we've talked about the argument in support of the view and some different ways you might respond. One thing for you to go away and think about now is whether you find any of those responses plausible or whether you want to agree with the limited materialist that there are no beliefs and no desires. Thank you. Thank you.